Hi and welcome to F World, the fragility podcast. Together with guests from around the world, we explore how fragility manifests across economics, politics, security, culture, development, and the environment, and how we can build a more resilient world together. We are your hosts. My name is Johan Bjurman Bergman, and I'm joined by my colleagues Michaela Karste and Paul Biska. And today we are speaking to Scott Guggenheim. Scott is an anthropologist by training and one of the originators of community-driven development, a model that gives poor people more agency in how development decisions are made. Working for the World Bank for over 20 years, Scott built his reputation as a maverick with a laser-sharp focus on making sure that local knowledge and local voices were heard all the way to the top of the hierarchy. While at the bank, Scott played a central role in assessing development projects' negative effects on poor people and developing policy guidelines that went beyond the greatest good for the greatest numbers and incorporated human rights considerations in a better way. Driven by his belief in the power of communities, he also founded the Kecamatan Development Program in Indonesia, the very first community-driven development program to be funded by the World Bank, covering more than 34,000 villages. He then went on to work as the senior advisor for the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, where he helped set up the scaffolding for the Afghan state following the 2001 US invasion. And in Afghanistan, he also created the National Solidarity Program, a community-driven development program covering over 38,000 communities. Scott is also a mentor and was my professor at Georgetown, and we're very glad to have him with us today. Welcome to the F World podcast, Scott. Uh, thank you, Johan. <laughs> a little flowery introduction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope it's uh, it's not uh, it's not too much. Uh, but we're uh, we're excited to have you with us and to explore um, your background and your thoughts uh, on on development. So we figured we would start from the beginning. Um, you were born in New York City, and now you're you're in Indonesia, uh, and having lived there for for quite some years. Um, what have been the formative experiences of your life that have that took you from from where you grew up to working on community development and develop uh, and development across the globe? Um, share share some of those with us and your your journey. Well, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, for what it's worth, I was, uh, as you might imagine, a, a pretty rebellious little kid, and so when I was twelve years old, I saved up a lot of money from a paper route and went to Mexico. Um, and spent uh, six months in Mexico wandering around, which is where I learned Spanish, um, and loved working there. So I went, when I turned 17, I went back um, uh, to Mexico for a while, and I worked in the um, uh, Ibero-Americana and the National Museum of Anthropology, which was one of the great areas of, of community development, over, uh, community studies overall. So by the time I got to grad school, I sort of already had the basic framework of thinking about communities like we talked about uh, in our classes not so much as collections of individual traits inside a village, but as social organizations that are part of much bigger historical and so sociological kind of currents. So, so I, st I came to the bank with that perspective. And when I got out to Indonesia in 1995, uh, late 1994, right, a lot of what I was thinking about at the time was, what can we, can we do anything with that approach to communities? Uh, my professor as an undergraduate was a fellow named Eric Wolf, who by coincidence, as a grad student, had written an essay comparing uh, community structures in central Java with community structures in Mexico. So it seemed almost like a natural jump to start looking at community studies when I got to Indonesia. Um, and then um, we, we did some black box studies on what's going on inside communities, where the big challenge turned out to be, um, when you have all this knowledge of how communities work and how they vary, can the tools of national development be adapted so that you can do things with them? Um, and that's how it all got started. It was a pretty straightforward line of, um, of Mexico and Mexican Latin American uh, studies having an influence on at least my approach to thinking about Southeast Asian studies, where in Southeast Asia, much of the social science had been driven by the Vietnam War um, rather than that sort of endogenous notion of how do we think about uh, localized uh, kind of development. So the blessing in a way, in, in a very sad way, was the 1998 crisis where the whole development edifice collapsed. 
and people were desperate looking for ways that you could still get support into what they thought was going to be sort of famine, large-scale population movements, lots of violence. And by working directly with communities, um, it w you could still, still go forward, even though most of the development infrastructure had disappeared in the collapse of the Suharto government. So that, that was the original uh, origin for that kind of work. And I just want to correct one thing is that, and I've written about this, is that what we did with the community development wasn't as new as people think it is, right? There was a lot of bricolage of pulling together bits from other kinds of programs, including some of Indonesia's own programs that were um, you know, bits on, on how to do community-based engineering or how do you do local level planning or um, how do you get financial transfers. So what we did was assemble things that were understood by the Indonesian bureaucracy Right, and the 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 bottom the most bottom part, there's nothing there that someone from Oxfam would find unfamiliar. The challenge is how do you do that with public policy in a developing country on a very large scale, and that that was the innovation was putting it all together into a single package rather than any one element of the package. So Scott, um, what do you think that your background in anthropology gave you that? Uh, let's say your your peers who are trained more as economists or development professionals or standard degrees. What, what do you think it gave you relative to them? How did that help you navigate all these very different environments that you worked in? Well, there were two sides to it, right? So remember, this was happening at the very first uh, um, movements on the green movement around the world. So the Rio summit, um, the Earth summit um, at, at the time. And what I was looking at for my PhD, I had gone to the Philippines, uh, where they were building, this was under martial law at the time, where they were building uh, very large hydro dams in the north of the Philippines. That's what, and that's where I was doing my field work. And I could see some of the terrible effects that the dam reconstruction was having on the villages where I was doing my PhD. And that was because in the highland part, they were trying to force communities to leave so they could take over the land. Uh, and it was so bad that at one point the Philippine Air Force was strafing the indigenous communities. And those are communities where there were marriage exchanges between the villages where I was working in the lowlands and we would go on these long marches up to the highlands and see these bombed out villages. So I found out that this was being, <laughs> that this was being financed by the World Bank. So when I was uh, starting my write-up, I thought it would be pretty interesting to see what did the bank actually know about all of this. And of course they knew nothing at all. Right? It was pretty much a large-scale civil war going on in the north of the Philippines. The banks financing it, and they had never left Manila. Right? So they had all these assurances from the government. So, so while I'm writing, I, I don't know what, what, what degree you guys are all working on, but you'll know that no matter what your fellowship was, you're bankrupt while you're trying to write uh, a thesis on it. So I was doing part-time teaching out in New Jersey, uh, but the cost of getting to the teaching site was, more, was higher than what I was getting paid to do it. So I knew this wasn't going to be very sustainable. So eventually I called every single classmate I knew and said, there gotta be something out there that would be useful by way of a job. And the person I called at the World Bank said, I hate this job, if you want it, it's yours, right? So that's when I went down for an interview in Washington DC, which I completely screwed up. Uh, and at the end of it, the, the, uh, a Romanian sociologist there named Michael Chernia asked me, so what do you think of Henry Kissinger? And figure, I figured I had already blown the interview I said, well, I think he's a war criminal who should spend the rest of his life in jail. At that point, he, <laughs> figuring I had lost the job, right, he then calls me back and says, he doesn't agree with me, but the fact that I would say what I thought was enough to get, uh, get the job going. And so what we started to do, he was the leader in thinking about the World Bank's resettlement policy, but he gave me for free reign to wander through the files and see how many more projects there were like that Philippine project. And it turned out there were a lot. So, so we wrote up a review of 25 big World Bank programs that were causing resettlement, and they all had pretty much the same story of large-scale human rights violations, not following the World Bank's own policies. Um, and I left to do a postdoc in South America, but he followed up on that and turned it into this big high-level uh, uh, cause at the very senior most part of the bank's management um, that would say that we're financing all this big infrastructure and not paying attention to the impacts. Now it ties back to the Earth Summit because the activist uh, NGOs at the same time were picking up on the same themes and talking about the, the very damaging side effects of development, largely with things like deforestation in Brazil and Indonesia, but also on the human fallout from these big infrastructure models and saying that the entire model is fractured. So you had external pressure, internal reviews, 
and I got called back from South America to go look at some more dams. This was in um, uh, Somalia for the first one I went to. At that point, they decided, let's take a look at the whole portfolio and see what a mess there actually is here. And so that was really Chernia who brought in other social scientists. When he was there, he was actually originally the only one. But I think about 1980, I think there were three. So Gloria Davis, who worked in um, transmigration, Marita Kochwezer, who worked on in um, the Amazon, and what, one or two more. And then I came in a little bit later. So I was part of the original 10 uh, 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 who came in. And in our area, we focused a lot on involuntary resettlement. And you essentially can't do that without talking about impacts on communities. Um, and so when this blew up at a very high policy level and as a cause around the world, um, and that's thanks to a lot of the uh, green NGOs, part of the answer is we're going to have to hire more social scientists to deal with these uh, social impact type of problems. So that was the entry ticket. Right? Then when I came out to Indonesia, it was to try and clean up the mess that one of these big dams uh, had caused in central Java. Um, and I went out there, it was just hopeless. <laughs> right? There was nothing to reconstruct. They had closed the doors of, of a dam with 35,000 people still inside the reservoir area. Um, so the army had gone in, it was a total mess. So we made some half-hearted efforts to uh, mitigate what was possible and not very much was possible. At the same time, um, I got started looking at um, some of, you know, there was some suspicion inside the government that the great Indonesia success story wasn't all it was cracked up to be. So I had been working with a, a political scientist named, named Robert Putnam on looking at concepts of social capital around uh, the world. And we started making, uh, we picked uh, three countries to be um, core pilots for an in-depth look at social capital metrics. So Bolivia, Burkina Faso, and Indonesia. So while I was wasting time trying to prepare this horrible dam, uh, we also ran these studies out across three parts of Indonesia, looking at are there ways to measure the amount of social capital and ways that you might think about using it for development. That study was supported by a very a, a absolutely brilliant transport uh, financial analyst um, who, who was a total a, a sort of square peg in a round hole who didn't really fit into bank thinking, but she was a brilliant financial analyst. And she also thought that this issue of never consulting people and just doing top-down development wasn't the right way to go. So as we're doing the, those studies that are looking at um, um, different forms of community organizing is when the East Asia crisis hit. So we had just been turning those social capital studies into a very, very, very small pilot program when the entire development structure was sort of swept away like by a giant wave. And so we made a sort of bold proposition, thanks to this financial analyst, that, would, that said that we think this can be scaled up. Um, and it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't entirely original. The Indonesians have been trying to figure out how to deal with their corrupt middle-level uh, bureaucracy and had been starting to transfer and decentralize a bit more. So we were able to build it up out of pieces to do a pilot program. But thanks to the desperation sort of everybody felt, it went from being a program for 48 villages into one for about 2,000 in, in just a couple of months. Um, and then because it was able to do 2,000, we could do quite a bit more. So those were the entry points. It was a combination of um, a looking at communities through the involuntary resettlement lens the social capital studies that were going on there, and that East Asia crisis, which sort of opened up the door for trying something a little bit new. So, Scott, we've already seen a pattern in, in some of the things we've been discussing. There is a crisis and then there's innovation. You've mentioned the East Asian financial crisis and how that led to the birth of CDD. We've also seen more recently with refugees that um, until the Syrian crisis of 2015, this was mostly a, a humanitarian issue until the development approach to forced displacement took hold as a response to this crisis. Do you think that um, crises in general and the, the inevitable toll of human suffering are a necessary evil for innovation to happen in development? No, of course not. I, I just think that for things that involve deep institutional uh, commitments, you need something to convince them that, that trying something new is better than just doing more of the same, right? So it's not all, I mean, this isn't an iron law that there has to be a crisis, but a crisis does help, right? And, and the reason is, is no great theoretical reason. It's because in development, what people tend to leave out are all the institutional incentives that operate. And what happens when in a normal development setup is everybody, it takes so long to get a development project started that once it started, people want to keep doing it. So when we were doing this in Indonesia, I think they were doing irrigation 23, 
right? Which, which you know, these things can go on forever. And when you look at education programming or health program, people are trying to build very big institutional delivery systems and thousands of people get invested in doing more of the same. So you need to be able to say, why would I change that for something that's been untested or unknown? It takes a lot to convince people to break that. So I'll give you a counter example. I, I think j the, the sort of the, the random, uh, randomized control trial people in, uh, based out of MIT and Harvard, have been doing brilliant work out here for a long time on why um, uh, food transfers are less efficient than doing cash transfers. So Ben Oaken, who I worked with for many years, started this as a grad student. Right? And he shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that it's a really inefficient and corrupt way to do food transfers, and it would be much more efficient to give cash transfers. So I knew him, and he's a young grad student. He's now a senior professor at MIT, and he's still writing the same paper, trying to convince the Indonesian government that you're losing billions of dollars every year by doing cash transfers, uh, by doing food transfers, when you could be doing cash transfers. And bit by bit, he's chipping away at it. You now have a constituency inside the government, but the politics of the food subsidies and the food transfer would mean thousands upon thousands of people have to do something entirely different, and it might even go to an entirely different ministry. So why would they possibly agree to doing this? It then becomes a matter of political will, right? So you don't need a crisis for that. He's chipping away at it bit by bit, incremental change. But for something like what we were trying to do, having a crisis really did open the door because there was no natural home right, in this very top-down development model for something that's much more bottom-up and participatory. So we needed the crisis, but not everybody does. So Scott, since it's not always possible to have a crisis on hand that can open that door to meaningful change within government and within development approaches, could you talk a little bit more about the barriers and the counter forces to incremental change, both within government, within development institutions? And I'm think thinking here about the example you gave on the food versus cash transfers. Um, that, was, that is ultimately a technical, let's say, call it technical problem that can be addressed um, through a technical solution. However, in practice, it ends up being a matter of political will. Um, and any departure from how things are done may depend only slightly on the quality of the research. So can you talk more about what other forces are at work to keep less effective systems in their place? Well, I think there's several, right? So first of all, I wouldn't overweight how brilliant all these economists are because they be it becomes a very self-referential kind of system. And I'll give you a real, a real good example. Right? You know there's a huge controversy about the poverty line. Right? That is to say, what you focus on with a lot of social protection systems is targeting. How do I make sure that most of the money, that all the money, is going to people below the poverty line and none of the money is going to people above the poverty line? Right? That's, it's almost like a religious dogma right now that accurate targeting is key for social protection and cash transfers. Now, villagers don't see it that way. Right? And there's reasons why they don't see it that way. First of all, that the, you, know, you never actually know what people's real income and expenditure is. So they use proxies, right? That's what a proxies mean test actually is. So you look at the quality of the roof. Do they have a television? Uh, do they eat three meals a day? And out of that, you're making your best guess on how much money they actually have. That has some pretty big flaws at the margins, right? One of which is, let's say you're, 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 you're a, a woman in a house. That's a very nice house. Uh, your husband is, uh, uh, is an industrialist and he suddenly drops dead, right? So on a proxy means test, you have a nice house, right? You have no source of income, so you're way below the poverty line and you get excluded from all these cash transfers. That's the first thing that happens. Second thing that happens is that uh, villagers will say, I don't quite get it. How come somebody who makes $1.79 a day is able to get a cash transfer, but someone who makes $1.81 a day is not, right? That is to say, they don't really see why this matters. So from a poverty targeting side, they're absolutely right. From a social solidarity side, they're absolutely wrong, right? People will say that what you started to do is take an American model of individualism and destroy our notion of community solidarity that everybody should get something. And when we look at what's wrong with that cash, the, the food transfer program, a lot of what they're calling corruption is actually leakage above the poverty line. People who say that just because poor people need some basic food, it doesn't mean other people shouldn't get something. They don't get the same amount but villagers will hand out food because they think there's real value to the social solidarity. So that's the second big reason. 
The third is, is that the targeting systems depend on having accurate uh, registers of who's eligible and who's not. Well, look what just happened under COVID, right? In normal times, you can do a survey and measure everybody's proxy means test and build up a data registry that's more or less accurate. COVID comes around and they find out that massive numbers of people lost their jobs because there's no more demand. They go back to the communities, but they're not on the lists. Right? How are you supposed to target them? All your micro, uh, micro enterprises, your push carts selling food, people who are cleaning the mosque, all of those just lost their job. None of them are on the list, and your entire social targeting system is predicated on having a national registry that you can make the cash transfer to. Right? So, so what people look at as well is the different metric on when does this system make sense versus some other system. So that's the conceptual part. The practical part is what I was saying earlier, is that you've built up huge institutional and political interests in why, you know, in, in, in buying the food, distributing the food, measuring the food, and it would be a different ministry that does the cash transfer. So it takes an awful lot of political courage and political will to say, let's just cancel this program that's been around for 40 years, right? Everyone thought, in 1979, everyone thought it was a great success. The fact that we're in 2020 and it's way out of date, that doesn't change the fact that an entire political party is running this thing, and you're going to have to convince them that they're going to give up power one way or the other and give it to somebody else. But like I said, I, I, I would, the institutional things, I think, are the fundamental reason, but I also wouldn't overweight how brilliant all this research is versus a lot of practical knowledge on it actually has many flaws. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's, it's so important, as you say, to not, not overweight that, but also then... Another thing then is, is how do you translate the insights from the social research, from the anthropological insights, and make that uh, palatable and understandable to economists? I know we have discussed before, and you've mentioned in your work on, on resettlement that you know some of these utilitarian economists came in with with, an, with the argument of saying you know with it's all about the, the greatest good for the largest number of people. And, and then, you know, it's, it's difficult to have even a conversation about resettlement because because it's, it's such a blanket argument. So how do you counter those types of utilitarian arguments that may be, you know, perfectly reasonable, but doesn't comp doesn't um, reflect the full picture of the situation and make it more nuanced? Um, so, so I think a couple of points on that, right? And, and, and I don't want to turn economists into the punching bags because I think that it's a pretty varied discipline as well. And you do have this gap between sort of bureaucratic economists who are justifying a certain development model versus real economists who actually do care about a lot of these issues. So it's been interesting to see in the past three or four years, the number of senior economists, essential banks uh, coming out with speeches on the importance of being, bringing community back into macroeconomic models. So, so uh, Mark Carney, who was the head of the central bank in, in, diff, in the U UK, as well as Canada, right, gave a big speech on this. I have one I can send you um, from Ber Ben Bernanke, nobody's uh, idea of an anthropologist, right, talking about if we don't understand community and the variance uh, in communities, we're never going to solve poverty in the United States. Um, uh, Raghuresh Rajan, who was the head of the planning commission and also an IMF chief economist, has written an entire book called The Third Pillar, uh, which is all about community and development. So, so your hardcore macroeconomists sort of get this, that, that markets don't regulate themselves as much as we thought they do. And there is a need for thinking about bottom-up, uh, participatory, social capital-driven type of things versus this sort of Reagan-Thatcher model that everything is fixed by the market and hyper-individualism. So I just think that entire ideology is sort of going out of date. Not, not enough, but it's still, it's still sort of heading out at the, at the sort of conceptual level is what you're asking about. At a more practical level, I think there's a lot of um, um, a, a, a lot of work to do, both on the analytics and on the operational side. Um, on the analytics side, some of this is just translation. I, you know, one of the oldest ideas in anthropology is that in sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, uh, countries or tribes that are organized by by kinship, so grandparents, parents, children, right, actually have a very different logic than ones that are organized by age sets where everybody who's a youth becomes part of one group, people who are much older become a different group. Well, a study just came out showing that social protection, uh, the cash transfer idea, right, it 
actually works very well in kinship-based societies and fails totally in age-set societies. And the reason is everyone sort of assumed there'd be spillovers, that you know, grandparents will give food to their uh, grandchildren, but in age-set societies, they don't do that. Right? So what you, and this was done, by, I think, by an MIT uh, group recently. They suddenly found out that social organization matters. Now, anthropologists have known that all their sources are from the 1920s and 1930s, right? so they've known this for a long time, but they couldn't translate it into economic language. Right? And so, so the question is always going to be, well, you, know, you study five villages, but there's 5,000 villages. How do I know that it's representative? Right? Or you have a lot of statements from people, but they're all anecdotes. I need to see a quantitative regression or a causal model here. So this is where I think that we suffer from the way both disciplines have been institutionalized. The easy answer for that is, why don't you get anthropologists and economists to work together? And the best programs are doing that. By and large, there's almost no incentive for an academic to work with another, another discipline, uh, whether that's in, in the development uh, institutions, but especially not in academia. So since these days, everybody comes with a PhD when they work at the World Bank or the IMF, right? They've already been trained not to cooperate with anybody else, right? And that wasn't really true a long time ago when you had much more mixed teams because they had practical problems to solve, right? If you were working on transmigration in Indonesia, you actually needed agronomists, engineers, water specialists, and so on. And now you don't really have those mixed teams anymore, right? Everyone has their own sector and their own specialty, and they try and keep everything within that bureaucratic bit of turf, right? So, so to answer your question in a practical way, first of all, you have to show that you can turn it into something that large-scale public policy can do something with, right? Either positive or negative. So showing that social transfers to age-based uh, systems isn't going to achieve your goal of better nutrition or better health starts off opening a conversation that if that doesn't work, what might work, right? The second part is, is that even if anthropologists, and it's not the only discipline around, has some good insights about how social structure affects development, you do need the economist to turn this into causal model and empirical tests and get some sense of, before I ask a government to risk $10 billion on a new way of doing things, I better be sure that I'm right. And it's not just the 20 villages that the anthropologists study, right? So, so my answer to a lot of your question is interdisciplinarity rather than saying one is right and the other is wrong. What I think what... I think what anthropologists bring to this discussion in the past has always been fieldwork, right? That they're actually out in the, in, the air, in, the, in the villages and in the communities and so on. And I think of that as an epistemological issue, not an empirical one or a methodological one. That's to say, you're getting the local person's point of view and you're looking at the tail end of the system to see how the system really works. And that's really important in development because there's a lot of incentive issues built into how statistics get gathered, how they get defined and how they get gathered. Um, and everybody has an incentive to report that things are better than they actually are, right? So understanding how poor people are accessing some of these big programs is as much an intellectual challenge as it is an empirical measurement question on who counts. And if you start looking, this is where I think feminist economics has brought a lot to this discussion, there's just a feminist movement. Looking at definitions, and when you see all these big surveys, um, who actually is the head of the family, right? In big parts of Indonesia, many in uh, Afghanistan, where I work a lot also, it's impossible for a woman to be the head of a family, even if in practical terms she is, right? So they always put like the husband's brother as the head of the family, and people assume there's an intra-household transfer going on, even though every measurement shows that there isn't, right? That uh, a, sing a, a widow's children are not going to be uh, fed as well. They are going to be stunted, but all the statistics show they're fine. Right? So this is where that uh, investigative approach of, of what the anthropologist brings on how the system really works adds something to a lot of the formal tools. Now, it's interesting, there, you know, two, uh, three days ago was the birthday uh, of Albert Hirschman, who I think is one of the founding saints of, of development anthropology. And it was a weird article because it starts talking about how um, randomized controlled trials actually were something very derived from Albert Hirschman which they definitely were not, right? But the reason they thought that, right, was because this forced economists to get out of the laboratories and, and the classrooms and actually go out and measure in the field. So I sent the article off to a couple of the world's sort of top people who work on RCTs, and, these, and I said, do you agree with this? And they said, absolutely. The big value of what RCTs has brought to economics is that you have to go out to the field and measure. Right? And, and I think that's true also. So I, that, that, and that's why I've always worked well with a lot of the RCT people, even though I know the critiques and I agree with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the critiques, 
the fact that they go out to the field, they learn the language, they t spend time validating at a very empirical level, to me is what a good, a good social scientist does. So you mentioned that we really suffer from the way anthropology and economics have been institutionalized and the fact that there's no incentive to work with one another. And you also said that it wasn't always this way. When I look back at grad school, at just overall my academic training, I see the disciplinary boundaries being drawn much, much earlier, even before us as professionals ever reach institutions. So, and it, I can't help but thinking that if we train students to have deep but very narrow expertise, we end up either with a lack of shared language or maybe with shared language that means something completely different. Either way, we can't talk to one another. Um, and ultimately, effective development programs require the ability to translate across disciplines, they require us to be able to communicate. And unfortunately, the way um, incentives, the current incentive present in higher education, introduce what is ultimately a degree of fragility in the very same institutions that aim to solve problems that are inherently cross-disciplinary. So it would be great to hear your thoughts about the role of education, especially higher education, and the way it's structured and how it ends up creating this environment where people have uh, little to no incentive to work with one another. Well, I entirely agree with you, right? I, and I, you know, I kept, even in the bank, I kept saying to myself, right, that when you meet some of these super narrow, very rigid economists there, it turns out most of them had only been there for six months or a year. They came straight from being a professor at some university. And the older ones who had been there longer and had to solve real world problems were a lot more open to the idea of interdisciplinarity, right? So, so I think you're entirely on the right track that it has to start uh, a lot earlier. Here, there's a couple of different questions that come up with that. You know that statistically, it turns out that a certain personality type likes to go to economics, right? That, <laughs> that, that the individual maximizer is naturally drawn to the field and people with a more empathetic or, or a sort of uh, socially oriented attitude sort of don't do all that well in economics. Now, I don't, you know, so it turns out to be statistically true, but I don't really know how relevant that all is, right? But I do find it entertaining. Uh, so I do think that what you're saying I think the root problem has tended to be more and more that the, as, a dipl as the disciplines get more and more technical, people feel they don't have the time or the incentive to work in a more cross-disciplinary way. And what's been happening in the development agencies, which is just the mirror image of all of this, is that there's less and less frontline engagement on what you do in project work. And it's much more now about the kind of analytics and high-level analytics um, that the development agents agencies are asking for. And that reduces the incentive for interdisciplinarity. But if you're asking me, do I think that's uh, is I think they're going I think they're going way off track by going that route, um, and it's much better to have. And I always thought that was what attracted me to development instead of academia was that you have to work with foresters and engineers and you know people who know things that that you don't. Um, I always thought that was the, the joy of working in, uh, in in development teams on that, right? And in fragile states, you're going to see this in spades. I, I just have to review the World Bank's. Um, um, what do you call it again, the fragility assessment for Afghanistan, where they're citing these national poverty figures, right? Now, and they're all built out of household expenditure, right? And the numbers don't make any sense, right? It has it at 35% one year, 72% the next year, 57% the year after that, and said not only do numbers not vary that much on things like poverty, unless there's been a giant drought or some other kind of crisis, but I said on top of that, half the country is controlled by Taliban. Do you really think that government enumerators are going into those areas with a, with a clipboard and a government uniform and saying, how much did you spend on wheat last week? Right? You know they're making up those numbers. Right? So, so it's not that the numbers are entirely wrong, but I wouldn't build an entire model of how to work on development in Afghanistan out of models that are so rubbery. Right? And, and I think you see a lot of this. And I gave you the example before that the way women enter national statistical systems should be the first point of challenge, not the first point of acceptance um, for thinking about these things. And there's many more areas like that. You know, in Latin America, the big revolution of the past 10 years has been the discovery that there's such a thing as Afro-Latinos, right? That the sort of black descending populations of Mexico and the Caribbean, uh, the Pacific littoral actually are black, right? Now, they didn't change color. They've always been there. It wasn't until somebody did a poverty assessment in the 1980s or 90s, I can't remember it was, and they were finally able to introduce a tag. And it turns out, big surprise, that poverty numbers are disproportionately high in the black majority parts of Latin America. 
And in some places like Mexico, for the first time, the president is admitting that there is a large Afro-Mexican population, and they're going to need compensatory policies for that. Now, Latin America has had more macroeconomic modeling than probably any place in the developing world, and yet none of those statistics had ever thought of this before. So I, like I said, I just, it's not that I'm criticizing it. I just think that you want to be constantly challenging the quality of the data and the concepts behind the data before you start making these very big uh, policy prescriptions. Definitely, definitely. And it, and it, but it, it's very interesting then, is there, is there, because there are such challenges in collecting data and particularly in fragile countries from, from communities, is there, what are the gains perhaps that a model like community driven development can, can create uh, the other way around, so, so to speak, are there gains where, where the, the CDD programs can help inform uh, policy? Are there mechanisms uh, by which, um, you know, they can also have, it, it, we can build kind of a, a virtuous cycle uh, using them, particularly in countries where, as you say, perhaps there is an insurgent group controlling large swaths of land. Um, sure. Well, yes, of course. So, so you, you need a couple of things to do that, right? So at the conceptual level, um, I think you, you actually need to decide that where do you want your errors to be, right? And a big problem, say, in social protection is are you more worried about inclusion error or are you more worried about exclusion error, right? And a lot of your poverty targeting people are much more worried about inclusion error, which is that people who shouldn't be getting it are getting it, right? Whereas if you had a more European background, you'd be much more worried about people who should have gotten it didn't get it. What that leads you to, and this is part of our argument out here in Indonesia, so I'm going to try and translate everything into economics for you. <laughs> right? Right? So what you, the first thing it's leading to is, do you want to have self-targeting systems or not? Right? Or basically demand-based kind of targeting systems. And the big pro this is why COVID was really illuminating that way, where they had invested heavily in making sure there's no inclusion error by using a centralized database for targeting. So a big national survey in 2016, if you're on that list, you get the, the cash transfer. If you're not on the list, you don't get it. But then we have COVID come in and it turns out huge numbers of people you wanted to get it, right, can't get it. So they propose, why don't you let the local uh, authorities decide that who, who came back, who wasn't on the list, but deserves it anyway, because they're starving to death, right? And you had this huge pushback saying that you're going to wreck our national data, data registry and fortunately, the government said, well, screw that. <laughs> we got to get this stuff out here or we're going to have violence in the countryside. So they introduced um, uh, self-targeting through the community development programs. And in six weeks, they found 8 million households who had been missed by the national transfer system. Right. So, so that would be a first example where, where, where actually it made a really big difference at the, at the back end on whether you open it up for those kinds of concepts or not. Right. So targeting is one really big area. Anything that involves demand side management right, is going to need a CD, I think, a CDD type of approach, right? Places where that th there are policy ways to do a lot of this, but you also need a lot more feedback on what's working and, and how do you get, um, I think Lant Pritchett's written quite a bit on this, uh, uh, on, on certain kinds of services require local knowledge and certain kinds require technical knowledge. So you can manage a central bank with five people, right? You look at money supply, it goes up, it goes down. But you certainly can't do local education service delivery that way. You have thousands of teachers who need to have the right incentives operating. And there, you know, this is why they set up all these parent teacher associations and school boards and community boards to work with teachers. At that end, five people will achieve absolutely nothing. You need to have things where whole communities are working with the educate the parents, the teachers, the principals and so on, uh, if you want to get better quality education. So I think it's this mix of the endogenous factors of the sector that you're trying to work at, right, with this balance between sort of supply-driven service delivery and demand-based knowledge. Um, and that getting that getting that formula right is what you're is how you get better development out of these big services. It's not that anthropology is right or economics is right. I think the problem you're trying to solve has to get defined differently. And then you think, what skills do I need in this place to do it? And I don't think you need community development for everything. Um, you know, you don't want heart surgeons as being done at the village level. Mao tried this already, right? But I also think that we have such a record of failures at, at sort of poverty service delivery from sectors that are trying to do it with that post-World War II giant technical delivery model 
and, and which can work in some areas, you know, highly centralized, wealthy countries, it works fine, right? And I always laugh whenever England is trying to convince people to decentralize because they don't decentralize at all. But in most countries, right, that's not the case. They don't have the technical capacities, and we keep trying to pretend that they do when a more partnership model would be just much more effective. So you just said that we don't need community-driven development for everything. Can you talk more about the limits of CDD? I'm asking, for instance, in my own work on, on security risk management in West Africa, one of the phrases often heard is that the community will take care of the security around a particular project. Where in reality, sometimes the perpetrators of violence are actually community self-defense militias. So what are the limits of CDD in your view? And uh, what are some of the environments in which it actually doesn't work? Yeah, sure. I, and I entirely agree with you. One of the things that's been a little uh, annoying to watch over time is what was meant as a tool, right? One of many tools that we have in the development uh, kit has turned into a bit of a religious movement among the proponents, right? That no matter what the problem is, community development is going to solve it, right? And that's wrong on several counts. What, one is the, the one you uh, already point out, which is that communities actually can't do everything. They're heterogeneous. They have a lot of weakened systems and so on. But they're also wrong on first principles. Right? That no, no development strategy is ever going to succeed in raising incomes very far if all it does is community development. Right? And so anything that would be an tra economically transformational kind of investment, industrialization, urbanization, that's not what CDD is set up for. That comes down, in my view, um, for what it's worth, right, to the difference between having an economic development strategy and having economic development tools. Right? And what people get obsessed with is the tool and not the strategy. Right? And, so this, and this has to, again, and due to the incentives. If you're a project officer in the bank, for example, just give you an example, you're rewarded for having a CDD project. You're not rewarded for having a strategy that has CDD, health, education, agriculture. Yeah, each of those has a different sector and a different task manager, and they never cooperate. Right? In theory, there's um, a country director, I think, is supposed to be doing that, but it doesn't happen. Everyone has their own project. And people get very obsessed with the turf, with the budget around that. But let me get back to some of the specifics. So what community development is for is, first of all, you have to make an empirical assessment of just how strong are those community structures. In Indonesia, it's really high. Every measurement shows that. It leads every single global survey, like the Pew Value Survey, on measures of any kind of social solidarity. Um, it's actually funny because you're from Romania, but, but, but next door to you, right, you have Indonesia tops the global list on sort of social capital and optimism kind of variables. And Bulgaria anchors the list. <laughs> right? That no matter what it is, they're going to say they don't like it. <laughs> right. And, and so what that means is that Indonesians overweight just how successful they are in terms of solidarity and East Europe underweights uh, what they're able to do. So you need some empirical assessment of just, you know, how much cooperation, how well do these systems work? You know, they, they, they're not the same as they were 100 years ago. There's so much more demographic change, technological change, new opportunity horizons that a lot of people in rural communities don't want to be in a rural community. Um, so, so I do think you have to get some assessment of how realistic is it to expect collective action at a community level and how much scope for action it actually has. So I'd start there, right? Then you start looking at all the things you're talking about. In many areas, you have negative social capital, right? There's gangs, there's, there's uh, drug lords that are there. They're able to cooperate with each other, but not for particularly good social purposes, right? So you got to look at those kinds of questions also. But, but the, big, the big question for me always is the one I think one of you two started off asking from the very beginning is, you know, there's a lot known about how to do assessments of community cooperation, patterns of participation. It's that engagement with the state that's the problem. Right? or the challenge, is it, can you work it out so that money that's sitting in a national capital actually reaches the ones that are at a decision-making level at the, at the local level, and when is the right time to be doing that? Right? And that's what we've been talking about, is that for many things, it's not the right answer, or it's part of a right answer, but you have to work out, is it actually going to get there? Right? And so you know, there's a, a pretty good study in um, East Africa that showed how they, they opened up the community transfer, they tried to use a community model, and they would transfer money to villages, but they could only buy services from the ministry that gave them the money. <laughs> so, so what, of course, what this led to was wildly inefficient and wildly corrupt uh, kinds of systems where it was a design question. It was no big empirical issue. It was a really crappy design because they hadn't worked through the financial flows of how does money get from one end of that system to the other. 
So I, I just come back to my basic point is it's a tool. It's like saying, do you like your hammers or do you not like your hammers? Well, you know, if you're trying to drive in a nail, a hammer's great. If you're trying to open a jar, it's not so great. So, and that's how I think about community development is the assessment of when is it the right thing to be doing. And if you've made that first determination, then you get into this question of how do I actually make it work? So n nothing terribly conceptual. And it seemed to me pretty straightforward, but, but it rarely happens that way. <laughs> Scott, I want to go back to the importance of understanding uh, the strength of community structures before using a tool such as CDD um, as part of a strategy. You also mentioned the fact that Eastern Europe ranks um, very low on variables like social capital and optimism, thus, in a way, underweighting what it can actually do. From my own experience, most of the programs I have seen in Romania, and I'm most familiar with uh, EU programs, these programs do little to no tailoring for the country's values. Uh, and that is important because, for example, from sources like the World Value Survey and other research, what really stands out about Romania is the deep lack of trust among the population. So much so, in fact, that it makes the country stand apart from its peers at the same income level or development level. So how do these economic development programs integrate this kind of information in their design? Do they use data, for example, from sources like the World Value Survey? Yeah, they always look at the World Value Survey. Um, yeah, the, um, it's like all the, you know, these are very good, very macro data sets, but there's a lot of variance within any one country, right? Now, but my general sense, and you know, you gotta be careful about overgeneralizing on these kinds of statements, right? Is that the entire post-Soviet belt, right? Is actually bad for CDD, right? Whatever, what, <laughs> Stalin did a good thing winning, the world, uh, winning World War II, but boy, was he effective at destroying social solidarity pretty much everywhere they stepped, <laughs> right? Um, and this day, whether it's Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, right, the former Soviet Union, I don't think CD is ever going to work very well, at least not for a long, 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 long time, if it ever were to come back at all, right? Now, within that, though, it's not that you can't, it's, you know, there, what people try to do that I've seen that I don't like either is copy the Indonesia model instead of coming up with more situationally appropriate models. So if you look at the EU, for example, one of their biggest programs actually is transferring to community and local government work in Hungary and I think Romania also. Whether that works or not, I didn't actually see any assessment. They keep talking about how they're doing it and it seems to be relatively successful, but I am sure it looks nothing like what it does in Indonesia, Philippines, or Afghanistan, that local government will be much more in charge of the kind of service delivery. So to me, the question is more along the lines of, it's not community per se, it's about where decision-making sits on a lot of the key questions. And some of those may be at a local government level, some may be at an informal community level where government is very weak, and some may be very high up. Um, so, so again, it becomes more empirical rather than uh, from, from a priori kind of deductions. So, Scott, by now you've mentioned Afghanistan quite a couple of times. It's a country that you know very, very well, and we're all painfully aware of the difficulties of uh, the transition in Afghanistan right now, especially given the withdrawal of, of U.S. troops. Um, let's assume that a couple of aliens um, knock on your door, and they say, uh, listen, we've been watching this now for, for decades. Um, last war has now taken 20 years. Uh, why is it so difficult? Um, what's what's happening? Um, can you tell us what's going on? And then a related question is, what if they told you uh, that actually, you know, this democracy building exercise was not very successful and we're looking around and we see that some authoritarian regimes are not doing so badly. So why not a good dictatorship? You know, 50 years of a good solid authoritarian rule in Afghanistan and you'll have better development outcomes uh, for everyone. So uh, what are your thoughts on these questions? Well, on the first one, the last person who was able to impose an authoritarian regime on Afghanistan was Genghis Khan. Uh, and what he did is the first time in central uh, Bamiyan that the people uh, rebelled against him. He just killed everybody and brought in Mongolians to, to, to repopulate the place. Ever since then, uh, everybody who tries to impose an authoritarian regime fails. And that's because it's a very consensual kind of political setup where, where the whole idea is that you mobilize factions around the consensus on who's going to govern it. I think that's built into the settlement pattern, 
right, that you have pretty sophisticated urban centers that are involved in very long distance trade, but ungoverned spaces in between them. Right? And if you look at the history of Afghanistan, you'll see that every single province, even though there's not very many people in these areas, has always been the center of a world empire. And the way they did it, it was always a puzzle for me. I went out to the, um, the, world, the world Heritage Monument, the minaret at um, uh, Host, uh, minaret of Jam, right? and it, there can't possibly have been more than 15,000 people in this empire that extended from Pakistan to Iran and across India. So how is that even possible? Right? And this is the reason, is that, is that they would mobilize very large numbers through alliances of different kinds that existed for the function of attacking everybody else, bringing back some loot, and they would eventually fall apart again. And we still see this model at play in, 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 in Afghanistan, that when a foreign invader comes in, actually everybody can unite against that one, right? And as soon as that threat goes away, then the, in, the internal factional fighting starts all over again. What's made it more complicated in the 20th and 21st centuries has been the role of neighbors. So for a long time, Afghanistan was pretty isolated and able to attack other people. But starting in 1979, and actually you know, beginning with the British, like everywhere else in the world, that's screwed up today. But after that, right, starting in 1979 with the Soviet in invasion, and it became part of the Cold War uh, apparatus, that's still playing itself out. So if you look at where the factional divides are, right, you have the Taliban on one side, who were the Pashtun resistance against the Russians. Now you have the Tajiks, which is the northern alliance in the country, which is what the, uh, the, the U.S. were supporting, the Mujahideen against the um, against the Russians, and that factional divide is still there, each with all their different alliances. So you will never understand Afghanistan if you don't look at the geopolitics of that region, right? Pakistan thinks that an unstable Afghanistan helps them in their ongoing struggles with India. Iran meddles less than it used to, but it used to see it as they're supporting Shia uh, against a Sunni incursion from, uh, from one side. And I gotta say, what <laughs> if you want to sort of uh, amusing take on this. You remember who Steve Bannon was, the former guy's uh, sort of policy advisor? One said he's actually smarter than he seems, even if, even if he is a, a bit of a jerk. But one thing he said is, let's see what would happen if the U.S. just left, right? Would, would, would Iran want to see a radical Sunni state uh, backed by Pakistan on its eastern border? He said, of course not, right? Would Russia ever plan to go back into Afghanistan, right? That will never happen again. They learned their lesson on that one. Would China like to see unstable Islamic radicalism coming up through the uh, Wakhan Corridor straight into where the Uyghurs are? So they're going to stop doing this. They said the only, and his version is, the only thing holding all these countries together is that the United States is there. So if we were to just leave, the regional powers would work out uh, a solution for this. I'm not sure he's right on that last one. Um, they, was, they could still use Afghanistan like a stomping ground. But he does highlight the point that the geopolitics of Afghanistan are fundamental for understanding what's actually going on there today. All right. Now, within that, what you have is, and I, I wrote an article on this fairly recently, right? The extent to which Afghanistan is a relatively poor country, and when it's not attacking other people, it doesn't have that many resources. The resource that it has ever since the United States went in is an unbelievably wild amount of money coming in in the form of foreign aid. So politics in Afghanistan are not about who gets to control industrial policy or should we be pushing an export-led agricultural um, uh, livestock uh, program um, or doing like they do in Ethiopia where they just do a green revolution. It's all about who has access to the aid flows, right? And so if you don't understand that, you can't understand the sources of instability or corruption or where the directions might be able to go. And that's why what the U.S. is doing now is actually fairly dangerous. Right? That, that what the U.S. wants to do is get out, which is entirely understandable, but they want to get out in a way like we, we sort of got bored with this country, so it's time to go somewhere else. So let's just put in an alternative government and watch, you know, let them, let them have an Afghan-owned solution to this, even though we, we sort of set the stage, provided the director, you know, paid for all the costumes, wrote the script, and now we can say the play is your problem. Um, so, so I don't see this as a, pretty, as a particularly sustainable kind of solution. Now, Ghani, who, you know, for a long time, he was a close friend of mine, and that's where I worked, the president, is also an extremely bad manager. He took all his skills from working in the World Bank and brought them to the Afghan government. So everybody is polarized, right? Nobody gets along. He wants to be in charge of everything, um, micromanages these things. So rather than build an inclusive coalition that would have involved buying off some of the factions, he now has them all sort of united against him. And the U.S. comes in, and they all say, if you just get rid of him, we'll play along with you. 
right? And that's what the next week uh, conference in, in Istanbul is all about, is how to set up an interim government. I was just commenting to someone on how ironic it is, is that we finally get rid of Trump, right? And a human rights, ethically based uh, of, uh, foreign policy, the first thing it's going to do is cut a deal between religious fundamentalists and opium smuggling warlords to replace it, an elected government and put that in place. <laughs> so, so just to answer your question on that, I just think uh, the short version of this is it's complicated. But the longer version of it is, is that you can't understand it without looking at the geopolitics and the politics of foreign aid as being accelerants on what was going on inside Afghanistan. And we're now in year 50 of, of that dynamic. So just kind of uh, tagging on to this idea of the, of the politics of foreign aid in Afghanistan, because I think it's a fascinating topic. And it's also something that, as you alluded to, is, is, not, is not a particularly recent phenomenon. I mean, there, maybe the scale has grown over time, but it really there has been some kind of subsidy from an external actor in Afghanistan since the 1800s. Um, and so, so in a country like that, when you look at it, it seems as if as long as the international community is the main source of funding and as such creates the economy, the people who are going to control the local economy are the people who can access the aid rents, which are the, the local warlords. So, so how, do you, how do you break that cycle or how do you begin to build a sustainable domestic demand that can actually run a, a, an economy and grow it over time and create those jobs that you know will for example wean thousands and thousands of, of farmers off opium farming um, and and help kind of get get afghanistan perhaps on a growth path well i'd start off by saying the one thing you're not going to achieve is weaning them off the one successful export industry that they actually have, right? That's highly technified and well integrated into every value chain you can think of. I would not start there, right? Now, the, the, to be more serious answer on your question, you know, someone actually said that we have no, you know, there is no Afghan war. There's a one year war that we keep renewing every year. So there, there really hasn't been much of a long-term development strategy for Afghanistan because you, you can see you know, to answer your question, it's actually not all that hard. Many countries, it, it's hard in one way, but not hard in another way, right? Many countries have faced this, right? Indonesia in the 1980s uh, was a heavily uh, uh, a natural resource dependent economy. It was desperately poor. It was all based on exporting oil and wood from the outer islands and transferring a fraction of that to the inner islands where most of the people were. But essentially what it was, was an oil based kind of economy. Today it's a G20 uh, member and it's entirely self-sustaining um, uh, uh, um, uh, economically. Afghanistan, what happened is they completely fooled themselves on the kind of economy that it has. So if you look at the statistics from 2002 to 2010, they show 10% growth per year. Obama comes in and says we're leaving and that 10% suddenly became negative 4%. Right? It was entirely based on the aid flows going into the country. Now, what did that do? Uh, uh, Michaela, you're, you're an economist on this. So what's the first thing that's going to happen if you take a country whose um, uh, annual budget is $400 billion, and suddenly there's $14 billion in it, right? right? You start to see the kind of distortions that you would exactly predict. So they can't export anything because they produce the same thing Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan do, except at five times the price. So, so there's nothing they can export, right? They also, it becomes much cheaper to import everything. So even though they grow oranges in Jalalabad, they buy them all from China, right? The same, and this is the entire economy is built this way, right? If you go to the southernmost part of Afghanistan and you buy a chicken, it comes from Brazil, right? These are not that hard to, uh, to sort of to, to produce domestically, but there's absolutely no incentive to do that. The second thing is when I got to Kabul in 2002, there were 400,000 people in the city. And it, was, it really was a pleasant historical city in many ways, despite having been <laughs> bombed by various factions. Now there's four and a half million, right? The city is nowhere near set up for four and a half million people. And if you fly over Kabul, you will not see a single factory in the entire city. The whole city is, is a bedroom city, right? There is no industrialization of any kind. And that's four and a half million who live one form or another from the aid transfers that are going on there. So you've had what's called Dutch disease in modern economics, right? Which is that you go from tradables to untradables. 
right, as a, as a wildly distorting factor across that economy. The third thing is that all the violence means that everyone has a short-term investment perspective. Why would you possibly, including the drug lords, right? I would have no objection if all the guys selling opium say, let's launder our money through property uh, in, in Kabul. But they don't. They launder through property in Dubai because it's so much more secure in Dubai than it will ever be in Kabul. So all your basic economic factors are fixable, and they're pretty easy to figure out what they are. Now, how do you act on those? Right? You're going to have to get past that fragility, and you're going to have to find a way that you have shock absorbers for that gigantic amount of money so it gets spent on things that aren't so distorting. Right? And now, you know, now we're, what, 20 years into this. There's still less land under irrigation than there was under the Taliban. Right? And this is an agricultural economy in a desert. Right? You don't have irrigation. You're not producing anything. Scott, you just mentioned how aid um, complicates the delicate balance between the different uh, social groups in Afghanistan and their complicated history. One of the popular arguments against aid is precisely that, that actually it comes into a very complicated context, um, it, uh, it exacerbates different uh, divisions and it, it makes changes to the local political economy, and essentially the, the counterpoint is you know, give war a chance. Uh, let them figure it out. Uh, in the short run, it could be a um, high human cost, uh, but in the long run, things can even out. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, for Afghanistan, it's stupid, right? That, that, you know, your, your basic problem there is that aid came after 30 years of war, not before, right? And like I said, that your, your, you know, your single leader on that Right. Uh, it, you know, it sort of ignores the geopolitical problem that you don't have the kind of infrastructure that would allow for a North Korea or a Vietnam party type of system. So all you would guarantee out of that would be more conflict. Right. So I, I just don't see the link. Right. And I do think that one thing, you know, as, as critical as everybody is and rightfully so about about what aid in Afghanistan does, you also have to take a, a look at and be re reasonable about what were your expectations of what was going to happen. Right? In 2002, when I first got there, and I'm developing a community development program, they tried to tack on right, that we would have a component that would pay the SWIFT charges. You know what SWIFT is? The, inter, the international money transfer system. Because the Taliban hadn't paid theirs for 20 years, so you couldn't even move money into the country. Right? Women's literacy was zero. Right? Average lifespans were 42 years old. Right now, they've gotten it up to 65 average lifespan. Women's literacy is a, a woman under 20 is about 65 percent. Right, some of the core institutions are functioning, but were people expecting? You know, there's a not to divert attention, but you know, there's a book by um, a historian whose name I forgot, but he talks about how of oh, Sean Willens, right, uh, how the United States had a democratic constitution in 1789. The first time they had a real democratic election was 1829, so 40 years later. Right. And he's right about that. They didn't have a party system. They didn't have re registries, they didn't have roles, something like that. We're 20 years into a country that was totally destroyed. Right. And it's easy to see all the things that went wrong. But there are things that went right. Right. And you, you do have a lot of. I mean, if you go to Afghanistan now, if you had been there in 2005, they have nothing in common. Right. It is much more developed than it was. It's not where we wanted it to be. But where we wanted it to be was also pretty unrealistic. Right. Even the World Bank's uh, fragility report says it's an average of 35 years right, before a, a conflict-affected country recovers. And that's after the conflict stops. right? So they have all that uh, sort of econometric analysis showing that. But the problem is that you know, the United States is bored with Afghanistan, so they want to leave. And therefore, a lot of the metrics justify how everything failed. And I do think, like I said, that, that you know, I think it was Eisenhower who once said that we didn't actually defeat the Nazis. We just overwhelmed them with, it, with the scale of our economy. And we have that problem in Afghanistan as well, that rather than think through what are the areas that would lead to growth, right? We just poured tons of money into every single contractor's idea uh, of what to get done. Uh, and that's had a negative effect. But I wouldn't pretend that nothing has happened. And that's why you're seeing a lot of pushback uh, by the Afghan population as well. And, you know, if, you, if you're following this, I think, Yohan, you are following it pretty closely. Nobody involved in these Istanbul and alternative interim government ideas is, is asking the Afghans, what do you think about this? How would you like to have a Taliban interim government made up with people who couldn't get 2,000 votes when they tried uh, uh, running in a, in a legitimate election, right? And so what you're dealing with, again, is great power politics that want to leave. Um, and I think it's a little unfair to push all the blame onto the Afghans. 
as opposed to short attention spans and, and bad policy. So Scott, on Afghanistan, let me set the stage for you. Imagine you had complete power. You're all powerful and then ignore any realities on the ground or anything that's like a realistic solution. So then can you let us know if there were one, two, maybe three or more things that could be done in Afghanistan that would help that country get on a completely different path from the one it's been on for, let's say the last 20, 200 years, what would those things be? Well, since you've given me all power, right? I would probably, ask, I would ask Australia if I can take one of their Pacific islands and move Afghanistan there, right? Where we, so, so that we don't have any neighbors to deal with, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so my, my big picture version of what I think should be done from a development side, this is what the paradox is. You know, Ashraf Ghani, the president, right? Wrote, made his career as an academic writing about how you need to think about the functions of the state in new ways when you're dealing with fragile states, right? And I think he's right about that. The only problem is he didn't do it, right? So, so I, the first thing I would do is have a very strong center of government that's able to coordinate the tools of what a, a Weberian type bureaucracy is able to mobilize, right? And I would have done that in a more inclusive way. So it's not just Gilzai Pashtuns running everything inside from the middle, but that you have enough technocrats in the main, in the main ministries, right? So. The, the fact that, you know, you see it right now, they finally put in a halfway decent finance minister. And the next day you see he's up at the border looking at customs, which is the main source of revenue, and finding that 90% of it is going off to local warlords. And he's trying to fix that. And each of these ministries as the center of government problem is a fundamental problem. The second thing I do from a macroeconomic side would have been regional integration, right? You know, you have big energy exporters in the north of Afghanistan gigantic energy consumers south of Afghanistan. And all they have to do is get the energy from the north, which is I think about eight cents per kilowatt hour, to the south where it sells for 14 cents per kilowatt hour. And it has to go through Afghanistan. So energy transmission, water transmission, transport, right? A regional integration strategy was where I would begin. And I would be running to China and hugging them for the Belt and Road Initiative to come right through Afghanistan if I could, right? So that you're gonna need a fair amount of capital uh, to make all of that happen. And you, to, you know, to do trade agreements on that scale, it takes a while. So if first is center of government, second would be uh, regional integration on making that happen. Um, third, third part would be that instead of doing 34 branches of government and 79 major ministries, I would pick five, right? And say, we got to get basic services to the population so that they see that all these things that are going to take a long time, like electricity towers, right? I also get something along the way. Right. And, and they haven't done that. Right. So and it's not and what you have are endless numbers of pilots and every sector wants a small project. I would have national service delivery programs so that everybody in the country is able to see that you can at least count on five or six basic services. Then the fourth area I would do it. You said I only get three wishes, but I want to throw one more in, which is that where the Taliban are beating. Uh, Johan's heard me on this before, where the Taliban are beating the government hands down is any notion of social justice. Right? And that's both formal justice and informal justice. And because it's a weak presidency that, that is built out of a coalition of, of various political factions, the amount of land grabbing that goes on, right? the amount of, of local level abuse that people see every day is like a recruiting agent for the Taliban. Their justice system is terrible, right? It's, it's along the lines of you do what we say and if we don't like it, we shoot you. It's still more popular than going through the government justice system or any form of local dispute resolution. So that would be my four, my four big areas would be those. So so no, I I think it, it's 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 definitely is worth a lot, uh, and it and it's very thought provoking. One thing that that's the, because there are, for example, there are uh, these large, as you say, power transmission projects that are in place or that are being developed. Um, there are, you know, the, as you say, China wants to pull the BRI through there up to Central Asia. So, so not just one, but, but many, many, many projects stand to provide significant incentives and significant gains for all regional powers. Um, what, what are, in your mind, the main obstacles to, to realizing that? I mean, Pakistan is obviously, we have a, a clear issue. 
but but even other countries in the region who are who are not perhaps pulling their weight uh, towards uh, realizing these plans how could how could they be incentivized to do that well no i actually think most of the other countries are pulling their weight right and so so uzbekistan's offering to co-finance rail collect, uh, connections for example they want to put up 500 million uh, dollars for their their leg of the link the afghanistan is now importing wheat from kazakhstan instead of pakistan it used to be 60% dependent on Pakistan. That's down to 30% now. Uh, Iran has actually, I was there for this. We were trying to broker a deal between Iran and the United States to cooperate on opium smuggling, with Australia being the honest broker between them. And it was the U.S. that broke off the connection. Um, but even now, I think this is going to be an area of possible cooperation between Iran and the U.S. as part of the good faith uh, gestures to go back to the nuclear deal. So I think the potential there is pretty high. India, I think you would have to, the, you know, the, the, the bottom line area on international side is India, Pakistan. You would have to convince India um, to close most of its consulates uh, and, and do a few things on their side um, as part of uh, brokering a deal with Pakistan on that. Pakistan is the rogue player in all of this, right? And you'd have to be able to find a way that, you know, the, the, money, the money for this is coming from the Gulf, mostly Saudi Arabia foundations that go into the um, um, a Pakistan uh, support network and the ISI from Pakistan. So you'd have to focus on that from the from the regional side. Um, but in terms of the regional cooperation, I actually think it's, it's doing okay. And one smart thing Ghani did was whenever they catch a foreign terrorist in the Taliban or in ISIS, he doesn't put them in jail. He sends them back to their country of origin where they usually execute them. <laughs> right? But the, the value of that is a real clear statement that he's not allowing any attacks on the foreign, on the neighbors, right, coming from Afghan soil, right? And the only area where he has to be tougher on that is on the, the Pakistan Taliban side. So what's been happening for a while now is that Pakistan's policy is not just anti-India, it's as long as the, the Pashtun Taliban are attacking Afghanistan, it means they're not attacking Pakistan. So they're really worried that if there were to be a peace agreement of some sort, all the Pakistanis who are now in Afghanistan will go back to Pakistan and be troublemakers there. So I think that's one of the key nodes is getting this Pakistan uh, linkage uh, more under control one form or another. Um, but in terms of regional cooperation, I don't think it's that. I think they're doing fine. Right. The, the weakness on the Afghan side is, is the center of government problem. Right. Is that they can agree at the macro level on all these agreements. The fact that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which runs them, never communicates with the Ministry of Finance, which has to pay for them, means that they get the agreements and then nothing happens, right? So, so each of them, the electricity transfer, the water transfers, the um, railway connections, each of them takes 20 years longer than it has to. Scott, I'd like to go back to something that you mentioned um, early on in our conversation, which was that when you first had your interview um, at the World Bank, you thought you had screwed it up because you were too brutally honest, uh, too direct. You were asked a question about politics, and you spoke up. Well, it's very obvious that this is one of the, the traits that, that set you apart as a development professional, uh, and I'd be very curious to know sort of how did you manage to, to keep that up um, throughout your career, um, to speak the truth to power and to, um, to be direct. I'd say there were two things that made it possible. I did come close to getting fired a couple of times um, whenever they would try and put in one of the sort of standard bosses. But so, so first of all, I actually had pretty good managers through my entire bank career who would put up with me. <laughs> right? Right? Now, now, to get beyond the individual personality, I would say there were three different things. The first is, is on that resettlement program, the bottom line is we were right. So we, we actually had the facts, and the manage, senior managers, the regular managers, all tried to sweep them under the carpet. But the senior managers, and we had a very elite senior management-focused strategy, so could see what a time bomb this was, right? In the middle of demonstrations outside the World Bank about environmental destruction, right? If they couldn't tell an honest story about how some of these dams are displacing half a million people at a clip, right? And they, their reports looked like they knew nothing about this. They knew they were going to be in big trouble. So at a very top level... We had high-level anchors that would back that sort of thing, even though a lot of the mid-level people, um, one of them once said, if he saw me walking down the streets of Bethesda, he'd run me over with his car, right? So, so you had really strong opposition at the middle, but we did have those high-level anchors, and that was a big lesson for me on thinking through that you have to have champions for these kinds of work to, to get away with it. 
right? In Indonesia, it's pretty much the same story. The standard sectors, right, hated the community development work. They just thought it, it intruded into what sectoral programs should be doing, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it. But the country directors actually backed it, right? And that's because, again, you know, your bottom line metric for a lot of Indonesia work is going to be, does it disperse any money in a way that the government is able to accept? So as long as we could go from, instead of just having studies with recommendations, to show that even in the middle of the crisis, right, you can get a quarter of a billion dollars out the door, despite the fact there were seven civil wars, is a pretty big selling point for any director. And the same is true in Afghanistan, right? That the community development work is by far the biggest project in their entire portfolio. So sectors can criticize it as much as they want, but no, 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 sector ma no country manager is going to say, I'm going to cut off my right arm just because these guys are unhappy about it. And that's what I keep telling, you know, the bank tries to move more and more into the sort of knowledge space than the social people do, but you still have to deliver something. You can't just be more studies. That's what universities are for, right? So, so the second part, if the first part is, is get a high level anchor, the second part is to actually deliver. And the third part is, is a certain amount of, there's a, a thin line between monitoring and evaluating and public relations, right? And we sort of straddle that line between looking at uh, a lot of evidence on things that would work, but also be able to sell it in ways that many people could read and bringing in NGOs and journalists and other people who would also see that, you know, even though it's World Bank and it's debt and you hate debt and so on, on the other hand, you have villagers saying that for 40 years we've wanted a road and we finally got one, right? So, so there's a certain amount of that that goes on. And I'd say the last point from my point of view is is I am an outlier on these things, right? And I, I, you know, a lot of people do knuckle under to the institutional conformity. It's very seductive, right? If you want to get, if you want to get promoted, you want to get rewarded. Uh, people start pulling back on things they know, or they'll say that we can only talk about this in strict confidentiality. I actually, didn't really care that much. I, I've never really liked the bank per se, right? So the interest for me was the kind of work that we were doing, and if they didn't agree with it, I'm happy to go somewhere else. Um, but I don't think that's the normal path for people. It becomes very much a lifestyle that you get used to. Um, and it's very seductive. Um, so it's not, you're not even aware of it as it sort of sucks you in from the inside. But it never particularly appealed to me uh, from, the, from the beginning. Well, I think that's a, that's a wonderful uh, note to wrap this interview up on. We started the introduction saying that, that you're a maverick thinker. And I think you just kind of underlined that, that point very well. Um, so I think some of the key takeaways that, that uh, we have gotten from this is really the, the, the uh, critical importance of adapting to, to local conditions and the, the lack of enough interdisciplinary work and how that can really harm uh, the, the, the way that projects are uh, implemented and their effectiveness. Um, and also the importance of differing uh, or making a difference between the tool and the strategy and recognizing how institutional incentives actually favor the, the former, whereas perhaps it would be more conducive to long-term development if they, if they favored the latter. Um, so with, with those words, uh, we wanted to thank you so much, Scott, for, for being here with us today, for taking time out of your schedule and getting up at uh, 6.30 in the morning in, in uh, Jakarta. Um, Great. Thank you so, fun. so much. Great. Good luck. I hope, I hope the series is a big success. We hope so too. And uh, to all of, our, all of our listeners, we want to say thank you for tuning into FWorld, the Fragility Podcast. And we hope that you've found our conversation with Scott today interesting and inspirational. We sure did. Um, so please subscribe where you listen to podcasts. And if you want to know more about FWorld, please visit our website f-world.org and follow us on Twitter at FWorldPodcast. Thank you so much for listening.